Hi, I was just doing some experiments on the new uh, EV Blog 121 GW multimeter, and hey, I thought this might make an interesting video. It's to do with the uh, true RMS uh, converter chip used inside this thing. It's the analog devices AD8436. Now, it's a relatively new chip compared to the ancient AD536 uh, it is that's been used in you know, every true RMS multimeter since like the 19, late 1970s, I think it is, that chip came out crazy. Anyway, it's a very popular true RMS uh, converter chip that's used inside all sorts of modern uh, multimeters. And we're using it inside this one to get uh, decent true RMS uh, performance of this thing. But hey, there's some little limitations that um, I wanted to test out and we're actually going to be doing something a little bit naughty with this chip. We're actually going to be using it outside of its uh, nominal operational voltage range specified in the data sheet. And normally, you know, you wouldn't do this in a bit of production uh, kit like this new multimeter, but um, uh, we have actually uh, confirmed with analog devices that it will actually operate uh, properly outside of this range and the company who's uh, doing this multimeter with me there doing some testing and I thought hey I'd uh, just check it out as well so it's all hunky-dory even though uh, it's outside of its nominal voltage range so you can actually do this you know as long as you've a, either uh, characterized it fully characterized it yourself to be you know fairly sure that it's you know, gonna uh, give you the results you want in production and or you've uh, cleared it with the manufacturer because sometimes they're very conservative on the data sheets and it does actually operate outside of it, uh, whatever performance uh, spec it is just fine. But hey, they didn't want to put it in the data sheet for, well, insert reason here, right? They didn't want to push the limits or whatever. So I thought we'd just do some uh, testing of that here and see what's happening. Now, the AD8436, I'll put the data sheet in here, uh, operates or has a minimum operational voltage of plus minus 2.4 volt uh, supply rail or in a single ended uh, configuration, which we're basically uh, going to be doing inside here. Um, that's 4.8 volts minimum. But hey, this multimeter actually uses uh, four AA batteries uh, to power this thing. So four AA batteries gives us a nominal uh, battery supply voltage of... Uh, six volts. But of course, when you're designing a battery power product, you want to actually maximize the uh, usable capacity in that battery. So you want to have the uh, cutoff voltage of your battery as low as possible. Now, um, in this case, of course, if we dropped it out at 4.8 volts, that'd be wasting probably half of the capacity in the batteries. I haven't checked, but it'd be a horribly high cutoff voltage of 1.2 volts per cell, and that doesn't include the uh, dropout voltage of the regulator. But hey, uh, this chip, uh, you could actually run it directly off uh, the batteries. But of course, if you've got a nice stable supply, you can guarantee uh, the performance is not going to change over the uh, supply range. So 4.8 volts is like, we don't want to piss away half the capacity in our batteries or whatever it is. Look up the characteristic curve for the battery. I've done many videos on that. So we need to operate this thing down lower. Preferably a nominal cutoff voltage might be, you know, a decent one might be say one volt uh, per cell. So we're looking at working down to four volts. So that's 0.8 volts lower than the data sheet value of this chip. But we actually want to operate it lower than that. We actually want to uh, put in a 3.6 volt voltage regulator because we've got a 3.6 volt voltage regulator for other stuff and uh, we want to operate it down that low. And we talked to analog devices and they said, yep, you know, it will actually operate down at 3.6 volts instead of the minimum 4.8 volts in the data sheet. So what I'm going to do here today is I've got it uh, powered from an external uh, supply here. I've actually taken the back cover off. I won't show you too much, but uh, back cover off there. And uh, normally you need to uh, spring the battery, the batteries in the back and the spring terminals actually, uh, you know, go down on that. So I've just soldered some wires in there that allow us to um, hook up an external uh, power supply there. And we can adjust that and uh, operate our meter um, down to any voltage we like. So that allows us to adjust our power supply and check its performance over um, any particular range. So I've got a uh, the Siglent uh, SigGen here that allows us to generate some AC signals and I've got the Keysight uh, 34470A which is a beast of a uh, 7.5 inch, a 7.5 inch, 
seven and a half digit multimeter. Um, so uh, we're going to use that to compare the readings. And basically, you know, if we adjust the different waveforms and our 121GW varies from our reference uh, key site here, then, you know, we know to investigate further. But basically, if we uh, change the voltage range right down and we test various waveforms and it matches something like the key site here, Hey, no worries. Now the AD8436 inside here is actually powered from a uh, low dropout voltage regulator in this case. So rather than like butcher the circuit and everything else and bypass uh, that and put uh, the existing 3.6 volt uh, voltage regulator on there, I thought I'd just drop the battery supply like this and actually let the voltage regulator drop out and then uh, we can lower the voltage but of course um, LDOs are famous for oscillating if you uh, get them below that dropout voltage it might be say 0.1 volts for say a 5 volt uh, voltage regulator so I'm just going to hook the scope up here to the rail AC couple it uh, there I'm only on uh, you know, 200 millivolts uh, per division should do it actually let's go down to 100 something like that to see and I'll just drop it below its uh, dropout voltage and and just make sure it doesn't oscillate and then that's just an easy way to do it there it is um, you saw it jump up because it's when I change the rail like this you should probably see it jump around a little bit there we go so I'm dropping out regulators dropping out now and it's following it's basically tracking that voltage rail down so whoop. 3.4 okay I've got it to uh, 3.6 uh, volts now on the battery input here and uh, the output so here's our input what do we got there we go we've got 3.6 volts and then uh, the output of the regulator 3.57 so there's just a little drop there there's not much current there's a bit of uh, drop but it's basically track that down very nicely so we can get away with doing that uh, the oscillation's not going to affect anything but that's worth checking and if you thought that was a problem hey maybe in like in real performance measurements you wouldn't do that you would uh, go to the effort to bypass but I don't want to butcher the meter so eh that's going to be good enough for today. So what I've got here is a uh, 400 hertz waveform generating. That's a, a typical uh, you know, figure, a nominal uh, specification figure for a multimeter. We could use a kilohertz or whatever. Or the uh, frequency range of this, uh, you know, is going to go up to many, many uh, tens of kilohertz. So I think the um, AD8436 is like capable of a megahertz if you opt megahertz bandwidth if you optimize. It's not going to be that hard, that high in this particular case. It's going to be uh, sub. 100k or something like that I believe so I'm generating a 1 volt RMS signal and ta-da we have 1 volt RMS so it's actually working just fine down at that uh, 3.6 volts no worries at that nominal uh, frequency so you know as a first order pass that's working just fine and of course if I adjust it it's going to take time to settle down you know when you're adjusting the supply you expect things to uh, jump around because the um, averaging uh, caps and everything else have to settle you're changing the whole uh, upset in the apple cart there but there we go that's basically uh, nominal uh, six volts um, although that's uh, voltage regulating there but yeah we can take that down to 3.6 volts no worries and uh, you know it's a little bit lower than what it was up there but that's just a uh, calibration thing basically so that is well within specification so it's already looking very promising but hey what we want to do is actually check it at uh, full scale here and it's basically bang on to the key site because this is a few, uh, a 50,000 count uh, meter so we want to test it at its full uh, range there full scale range no worries I mean that's practically bang on and then if we check it down at uh, 0.1 volts so we're getting right down there at the uh, lower signal levels um, on the same range, then it's basically pretty much bang on as well. So beauty, it's looking good. But of course, we're using a pure sine wave here, and that's a relatively low uh, crest factor waveform. Now, the crest factor is actually defined as a uh, ratio, and it's a ratio of the peak value, oops, shouldn't have touched it, ratio of the peak value, bloody touch screens, the peak value of the waveform, which is the peak value of the sine wave, divided by the RMS value of the sine wave. So a sine wave actually doesn't have a crest factor of one it's actually got a crest factor of you guessed it that 1.414 um that your figure that you're actually uh used to which is the peak 
uh, ratio. So, and in fact, if you put a square wave into this thing, then a square wave is actually a crest factor of one because its peak value, um, it's, it stays at that peak all the time. So the peak divided by the RMS is actually the value. It's, it's a definition of a perfect crest factor. So you might think, oh, square waves are bad for true RMS converters. Um, they're actually not. They're real, you know, as good as you get in terms of uh, crest factor. And uh, depending on the R true RMS uh, converter chip used, um, you might, you know, you'll typically have a crest factor limitation. They might tell you the maximum crest factor is four. Or uh, you might read the data sheet of a multimeter and it tells you, hey, the RMS values are only um, uh, in guaranteed for this spec up to a crest factor of four or eight or something like that. The um, AD8436 is specified, you know, its specifications are given up to, nominal specs are given up to uh, a crest factor of anything up to 10. So, you know, that's some pretty horrific type uh, crest factor. So we'll try something with just a little bit more um, oomph, shall we? So we'll go into uh, waveforms here. We'll go into... Uh, I mean, we can. Noise is a pretty bad one, but we'll go into ARB here, and we'll actually do a um, sine x on x, which you know it's mostly low for most of the period. Then it's got a big spike. So, like switch mode power supplies are a common example of this. That'll have bad crest factor waveforms and stuff like that. And incidentally, the AD eighty four thirty six actually has a specific pin to add an additional. Uh, averaging capacitor, like a higher frequency averaging capacitor for those shorter uh, peaks, as well as having a larger average capacitor value. So this is a pretty neat chip. That's why it handles crest factors uh, quite well. And uh, certainly the uh, EV log meter has both of those um, caps built in to handle the higher crest factor waveform. So this is going to be a reasonably high crest factor uh, waveform. You might typically get, you know, overshoots like that and, uh, you know, spikes and things like that. So, hey, look, right down already. Look at that. Look at that. 22 point, we're basically bang on. Let's go back up to um, our amplitude here and go uh, one volt. Uh, oh, we can only do peak to peak here. Okay, we can't do the uh, RMS anymore. But yeah, it's tracking that. No worries at all. And if we go up to 10 volts peak to peak there, it's, look, it's pretty, you know, it's not quite bang on, but it's pretty darn close. It's well within spec. So it's operating quite well with large crest factor signals uh, down at a 3.6 volt uh, chip supply limit, well under that data sheet value of 4.8. So it's, this chip is very conservatively specified. And by the way, uh, 3.6 volts uh, will be the, um, the highest operational voltage part inside this meter. So this allows us to set our dropout voltage, uh, our low battery uh, detector voltage, not much above that uh, 3.6. So you might set it to have to look at the data sheet for the regulators, the low dropout regulators used in this. But, you know, it might be typically 50 millivolts, 100 millivolts, not much above that. So 3.6 volts nominal would give a low battery uh, warning indicator of 0.9 volts per cell. And that's pretty dumb good you're using up you know vast majority of the energy inside those four AA batteries so that's quite good design you don't want to be you know pissing away that battery capacity and of course we can uh, you know select all sorts of other waveforms here what is that exponential rise there we go doesn't matter what ARB type built in. This has got all sorts of built in, uh, you know, uh, math functions and, you know, you can have engines. So if you like a cardiac pulse, there you go. We can choose a, a cardiac pulse and bingo. There we go. So it meshes a cardiac pulse. No problems with all, at, at all. Seems to be working very well. Uh, basically the only variable left really that would be a concern would be uh temperature really because you know low powered from batteries low dropout voltage regulator everything else you wouldn't worry about you know power supply rejection ratio and you know other system stuff like that's not really uh relevant here so probably temperatures the performance over temp would probably be the only one left so how does it perform over temperature i'm glad you asked oh uh, we've got uh the old uh, thermal chamber here which we haven't seen in uh, quite some time and i'll just like ramp it you know 10 15 or maybe 20 degrees if I can and basically just uh, see if it matches so we'll give it a bell I'll come back because it's pretty boring to watch
So at the moment we've got a value of 0.777, let's call it whatever, um, 7777, and uh, which is fairly close to the key site there. And of course the key site's out of the chamber, so that's our control, it's not going to change. And uh, we'll see if there's any effect with increased temperature. But of course here we're not concerned whether it's an increase or decrease in temperature, we're just concerned with the temperature delta, i.e. delta just means change, the change in temperature. Um, so, you know, it doesn't matter. We just want to uh, get a measurement on the multimeter at two different uh, temperature points. You know, 5 degrees might tell you, you know, 10 starts to be reasonable. You know, a 10 degree C change might be a standard uh, control or something like that. So we'll ramp it up at least uh, 10 and see if there's a difference. If, if not, then I wouldn't be too concerned. I mean, this is not some ultra full-on professional testing that would take weeks and weeks and weeks where we'd fully characterize it over the entire uh, operating temperature range and everything else. I just want to see if it makes a difference. Because I try trust that the uh, people at analog devices, when they say, yeah, it works at 3.6 volts, we just don't put that on the data sheet, then, you know, I, I trust them that they've, you know, they know their part very well and they know it's going to perform at that. So one other thing we've got to test for is frequency range as well. So I've taken it up to 5 kilohertz here. We're down at, <laughs> sorry, this is a bit complicated. We're down at uh, 3.6 volts again and we're getting 1.00 five there so and we can take it up higher in frequency 10 kilohertz 20 there we go the uh by the way the key site one's got like 300 kilohertz or something um 20 we're still hanging in there but now we're starting to get see you know a few a couple of a percent out you know we're starting to get a a few percent that's 30 6 kilohertz, 37. I mean, if you want to talk about the minus 3 dB point, then it's going to be massive. Um, you know, so we're up at 65 kilohertz now. But anyway, that's not the point. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is, there we go. If you can probably go down to the 0.707 point at 120 odd kilohertz or something like that. Um, but what we want, what I'll do is I'll just tweak it to 1 volt precisely on there and just use that frequency point as a uh, ballpark. What do you think? Sounds good. There you go, 17 kilohertz. Now time to ramp the temperature up. And we're up to 39 degrees and on the AC performance at uh, 39 degrees C we're looking at uh, you know uh, 0.3-ish uh, percent change or something like that so yeah not much. And if we change it back down to the 5 kilohertz uh, reference, it's almost spot on, isn't it? It's basically ramped up to 38 degrees now, which is a good 15 degree uh, differential on there. And, ba and uh, by the way, the back is still off, so the airflow is going directly over the chip. It's going to, you know, uh, there's little thermal mass uh, inside there in terms of uh, the chip. So it's going to change almost in real time with the uh, chamber, basically. And it hasn't drifted at all. I'm not sure if you can see that. Yep. And glare on there. Yeah, no point. Double seven, almost double seven. It hasn't changed a smidgen in 15 degrees. So I'm going to call that a win. So there you go. I hope you found that video interesting in using a chip in a commercial application outside of its nominal uh, specification. And ordinarily, as I said, you wouldn't do this, but there's good reasons why we're doing it, because we want to get that uh, low dropout, you know, voltage on the batteries and everything else. So, you know, it's it's pretty important. And that's the chip that we want to uh, use in that application. Yeah, there are other options maybe, but, you know, that's the chip that we're uh, going to be using here. And it works just hunky-dory, so I'm pretty darn happy with that. Um, I'm going to do some more uh, testing, but that's basically uh, confirmed that no problem whatsoever. Yep, no worries. Um, no problem in using that in this particular application. Now, that doesn't mean that the chip is fully characterized down to 3.6 volts, you know, at higher signal amplitudes, which we may not be seeing in this, and close to you know, it's full operational range, which we're not using over and stuff like that. It could, you know, there could be uh, traps in there for that. But, uh, you know, for the particular application that we've got here at full scale input uh, voltage and at the low end, so we measured full scale and at the low signal level as well. No problems whatsoever, no problems over temperature, no problems with uh, crest factor. So I'll just do a, um, some more uh, experimentation, but yeah, that's that seems pretty solid. So analog devices were right when they say this thing works down at 3.7, 3.6 instead of the nominal 4.8 in the data sheet. But yeah, you know, 
don't try this at home. Make sure you stick to the data sheets unless you absolutely have to go outside. You have a very good reason to do it. Lots of traps for young players doing that. But anyway, hope you found it interesting. Catch you next time.